Okay, all you T37 folks out there, we're getting real close to launching our T37s and getting them wet. So it's time to get going on our radio installations. And the first thing I wanted to cover was installing the batteries. You'll see why such a simple thing is uh, so important later on. But this is a four-channel transmitter. You can get more, but this was originally designed for aircraft, so you get uh, throttle, rudder, aileron, and uh, flap control. You only need two channels. These radios are not super high cost, but they're entirely adequate for what you need, and they're not going to slow you down in a race. So don't say, I didn't win this race because I didn't have an expensive radio. These are just fine. The range is just fine. But, like I said, I wanted to cover one thing. Installation of the batteries. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but in the back here, these are the springs that hold in the batteries. And not all of these springs stick out as much as others. This is critical. You do want to make sure that all of these little springs are sticking out so that they're firmly clamping the AA batteries. This will take eight AA's. Now, I can say from bitter experience that I have had problems with this where this, the uh, batteries were not held in place and I started losing my transmit signal just because I had a loose battery. So this is the first thing to do. All right, I'll be back to you in just a little bit. I'll install the batteries and we'll see in just a second, okay? See you later. Okay, T37 folks out there. We're getting closer and closer, so I thought I'd go over the components that we're going to be working with, what you get in your kit, and all that sort of thing. So I started on the batteries on the transmitter, and I thought I would continue on discussing the various aspects of the transmitter. So most important thing is here's your on-off button here. So when you turn it on, if you got good batteries, it should show a green light. If they're getting kind of down a bit, it'll go yellow and when they're really low it will go red. If you see a red button get your boat in right now and replace it. This red button generally means you really don't have much time. Okay so another thing this is your binding button you're gonna need to use this button for binding your receiver to this if you ever get a replacement receiver and I do recommend that. These are reverse switches so you can change left to right, right to left uh, like if you would prefer your sail servo to go out when you put the stick all the way up, you can switch the servo on that and it'll reverse it. This is your rudder. The rudder is always on the right and the stick always centers itself. That means that if you're sailing along and the boat's turning and you want it to stop, you just let loose and it'll center the rudder and the boat will steer straight. The sail control is always on the left notice that it doesn't have a spring on it. So uh, just in out and uh, that'll pull the sails in and out and like I said you can have out at the top or the bottom. I've labeled this for two reasons. One is to show you and two if I let anyone else use the radio they will know that in and out are labeled. Uh, different people use different commands so that is a very cool thing if you're gonna loan your boat out we have fine tune here on the bottom I'll show that in just a bit but this allows for some minor movement to fine tune the angles on your servos uh, here's the antenna you do not want it out like this you want your antenna up like that or like that for the best signal so that's it on the transmitter now this is the receiver and I'm unplugging these components, but the receiver is the brains on board your boat. This is the antenna. You want your antenna to be under the deck. You want it as high as possible. Now, these servos or these uh, receivers have pins. The top one is for your battery, so your battery box is going to be plugged into the top. Your rudder servo is uh, going to go in channel one. Your sail control servo channel three. That may change, but probably that's going to be right. Now, this is the battery uh, box. Four AA batteries. You want to uh, spritz these with Bow Shield. Now, I'm going to show you in just a second. 
This is Bow Shield that I use as a corrosion uh, preventative. Now, I'm going to spritz this right now, and this is going to be something you absolutely want to do before you get your boat wet. Okay, I shot a little bit of the Bow Shield in there. Now, I'm going to plug this in, and this will give me much, much longer uh, life with these components. Water does affect them, corrosion and rust happen. So the other thing is, I'm not going to do it now, but I'm going to spritz the contacts with a bow shield to help keep the rust down on these springs. So, bow shield or some other corrosion preventative is a must. Do it. Now here are our servos. Um, the rudder servo is uh, very uh, uh, much lighter duty servo than the sail control. And that's because the rudders have very low loads on them. So you don't need much of a servo. This is pretty low load, not much output on it. Uh, the the uh, output on this right now is just a round disc. You have a variety that will come in your servo kit. So you can install these kind of square ones or linear ones. You have a package with various outputs. Uh, at this point it really doesn't matter too much. But your sail control servo is going to have uh, its own custom servo that comes in the kit and the arm is going to be much longer and that's because you need to move the sails quite a bit and you're going to tie the jib sheet and main sheet onto this arm. So your kit will have your sail control arm in it. Now uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you about this is your binder plug. Do not lose this. This is very important. Uh, occasionally you may have a power surge or something. Every now and then your transmitter will stop talking to your receiver and you need to rebind it. Now by binding, what that means is that uh, let's say you've got 30 boats out there racing in the Nationals and your transmitter is only talking to your boat and the thing that allows that to happen is this binder you have bound your receiver to the transmitter. Other than that, everyone's radio is producing the same output, so you need to keep your binder. You'll also need to keep it if you get a new receiver, or get uh, a replacement. I highly recommend that you get a spare battery, a spare switch, and a spare receiver. These things will go away with time, Go ahead and get them now, and get them from Will. Um, the, uh, the cost from Will is really not much different from anyone else, and he knows exactly what you need. So just uh, if you're ordering your kit, just tell Will to include another uh, receiver, battery box, and switch. Let's plug these in. So at the top, that's where our battery goes. And you can see that I have a black wire and a red wire. So the black wire goes forward. So that goes in. Be careful, they're very fragile pins. So you can see that I have the black wire here forward. All right. Now the next one to go in is going to be our sail control servo. Again, black wire forward on channel three. So work it into where it seats properly. And then the last one, again, black wire forward, channel one. So our rudder's in channel one. Now let's turn these on. All right, I'm going to stick this in my pocket. So here, the black output arm, that's our sail control servo. Notice that it's all the way in. In fact, I'm going to stick this right here now, the rudder. So watch this. As I move this all the way out and all the way in, it moves. Uh, this is set for about 90 degrees or so, but if you get an upgraded servo, and I would suggest it uh, after you get a little bit of time in the boat, you can program them to go all the way to 180 degrees. Now, let's look at the fine tune. So let's say I really want this sail all the way out. I'm going downwind. 
So if I move this fine tune all the way to the bottom, the sail control arm moves farther. Now let's say I'm going upwind and I really want the sails in super tight. If I put my fine tune up and my stick all the way up, that's really, really tight with the sails all the way in. But maybe I don't want to go that tight for waves or something like that. So I can adjust the fine tune and I'll keep this arm all the way in. But I can do the fine tune and get uh, a little bit of opening of the uh, slot with letting the jib or the mainsail out a little more. Okay, so let me then go to the rudder. All right, so here's my rudder servo. Now, you see that this operates very much the same way. It's only going left and right on the stick. Now, the same thing with the fine tune. Watch the uh, arm move as I rotate the fine tune. Okay, you getting that? So fine tune is used to center your rudder perfectly and get the boat to where it tracks right. So that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and spritz more of the bow shield on all my connectors and make sure that that is corrosion protected as best as I can. And uh, then we're going to get on to installing the radios in the boat. All right, we'll see you in a bit. All right, so we've covered the basic radio components. So now we're going to get ready to start the installation. But we've got a couple of things to do. First thing we need to do is get the rudder to where it's installed in the hull. So what we want to do is take a 3 32nd inch drill bit and we're going to ream this hole out. Do be careful. So, that wasn't too hard. And I'd go back the other way too. Be careful to keep it aligned. There we go. That was all to that. Now I'm taking fine Scotch Brite. I'm just going to clean the post off a little bit to get rid of the residue and make this operate more smoothly. There, look at that. All right, well, it seems to be operating pretty smoothly. And in fact, it may fall out. So here we go. Now, one thing that's probably a little difficult to note, but the top of this rudder post is sticking up slightly above the deck. We need to get it at least level with the deck and probably just very slightly below that. So I'm going to mark that. I'm going to take a heavy duty clipper, clip that, and then you need to dress the edge. You're going to have a flat spot if you don't do this, so you take a very, very fine file. You could also use sandpaper. And in fact, you know what I'm going to use? This is the little uh, uh, push rod thing for the top of the rudder that slides right on there. So we're looking good. Let's stick this in here now. It's still very slightly proud. So I'm going to take this down just a tiny, tiny bit more. The reason you don't want this to have any flat areas, you do have that little rubber gasket in there. It will be hard to get it past there, and it's a pretty tight fit. So let's check this thing again. All right, so the bell crank slides on there very nicely. Take a look at that. See? All right. So, that looks like a go. Now I'm going to slip this on here temporarily. And I'm just going to hand tighten it at this point. There. So the rudder is held in place. 
Now I'm going to show you this, but you see this installation? This bell crank is what turns the rudder. Okay guys, we're getting ready to do the push rod for the rudder, and this is a very critical part since the length of this push rod determines where we install the servo. So when you make this, you do want to be accurate. Now, in your package, you should have this one rod that is 16 and 5 sixteenths inch long. So, fairly long stainless rod. So our first mark needs to be 5 sixteenths of an inch from the end. So 5 sixteenths is just over a quarter inch. Alright, so I got that marked. Now, the next one should be, let me check the dimensions, the next one should be 15 and a half inches from that mark. Okay, so from that mark, 15 and one half inches. Okay, so there we go. Now, these push rods are going, or this push rod is going to be bent at 90 degrees on each of these. You want to make sure that these pins line up. In other words, you don't want to bend this off at this angle and have this other one bent at that angle. You want them to align perfectly because these are going to go into the bell cranks on the uh, servo motor and on the rudder. They need to be aligned. So I am going to start this and I know you can't see the mark but I'm about a 32nd of an inch underneath it. The reason for that is if you hold the edge of these pliers right on the mark you'll actually shorten it a little bit. So you want to be maybe a 32nd of an inch or something like that below that. Now hold that there and that just got it started and now I've got this clamped in the vise and I push it over and I'm going to take this hammer and tighten the bend don't kill it, don't beat it to death there, but you can see that's pretty close to a 90 degree bend right there now the next challenge is I need to make sure that this bend stays aligned with this. So again, I'm going to start it with these pliers. And I'm going to make sure that that is square to this. And now I am going to That looks pretty good. I'm going to complete this now. And just so you know, if this is off a sixteenth of an inch or so, that's not the end of the world. It's not like you need to go get another one. But I just wanted you to be careful so that you would get this uh, aligned properly and you'd be putting the rudder uh, servo in its proper place. Now, that's not bad. I don't know if you can see that, but the two posts, the vertical posts that I bent, should be pretty much in line with each other, and I think that's pretty good. All right, so I think I can trim this little tab off a little bit. It's a little bit longer than it needs to be, but uh, we'll see. Don't have to worry about that now, so we'll talk to you in just a bit. Okay guys, we're getting ready to install the rudder servo and one of the things that's required on that is because we cut the push rod to length, we have to install that first. We cut that very precisely and that means that we need to install the rudder servo with the rudder exactly centered and with the bell crank arm exactly in line. So it's installed the thwart ships, that means this needs to be aligned that way. This could have been turned at some point so we have to realign this. So at this point I've plugged these back in 
I've got the transmitter ready to go. And by the way, I installed the real sail arm on the sail control servo. This is the bell crank that's uh, included in the kit, so I've shifted that over. So let me turn this on, and let me turn that on. Okay, I've got a red light here on the receiver, so I've got a signal. I have this centered. You can see that this is moving. So I've got this centered. It does that automatically. And then the fine tune, we're going to put that right on the center also. So what does that mean? It means that this is not quite aligned. It should be like this. So here, let me get this. Let me get this up closer to the camera. Now, you can see that this is directly straight in line here. Now that doesn't mean that if we mess this up a little bit, we can't fudge it just a little bit. But this is how we want to start out, okay? So we're all set on this end, and we're going to start the installation here in just a little bit, okay? We'll see you in a second. Okay, so I've installed the push rod here. I've got it on the bell crank for the rudder and I've got it fitted on here we know that I've got the bell crank straight aligned across here so now we need to decide where the position of this is <clears throat> so I've offset it approximately 3 16 off of center line towards the left the sail servo is going to go behind this so the rudder servo is the forward-most servo. The second one behind is the sail. I'll get you a picture of this in just a little bit. But here's the very high-tech way that we center the rudder. So I've got this pretty much aligned by eyeball this way, running straight athwart ship. Now, I'm basically just going to adjust the length until I'm happy with the rudder being aligned on the center. Now we want this pretty close. We actually want this very close. But remember our fine tune? We can fine tune the rudder a few degrees one way or the other just in case we're off. So we do have that saving grace. But right now I'm thinking we're pretty good. So I'm going to take my fine tip pin and I am going to mark that. Now you can use the servo mounting tape, but I'm a little nervous about the long term lifespan of that. So I'm going to install this using number eight sheet metal screws that are pan head. I'll show you one of those. And these are one and a half inches long. So this is a pan head screw. It's slightly fattened, or flattened at the top. Not a round head, although that would work. But this is a sheet metal screw one and a half inches long in stainless steel. Should be available at most hardware stores. So I've marked that. And I'm going to get my drill. I'm going to drill a pilot hole in this and uh, install this one servo and then we'll be ready to install the next ones after that okay so we're moving along see you in a bit all right so i've changed my perspective a little bit here and i installed the rudder servo and the sail servo as you can see i don't know if you can see it but the rudder servo is offset to port slightly and the uh, sail servo is offset to starboard slightly. Uh, look up your instructions and check the diagram just to make sure. Now the other thing you can see are two black strips that I've laid down a velcro hook and that's adhesive backed one inch wide velcro hook. <clears throat> now that's what I'm using to organize my RC components underneath the deck. In a little bit, I'll show you the rest of the uh, components, the receiver and the battery and all that, which have Velcro loop on them. Anyway, 
So that is the installation. You can see that I've got my sheet metal screws screwed in there holding the servos down. And then I'm going to go back and you can look at the rudder post and see that that looks pretty good. So that should all be organized. I'll come back in just a second. I'll have the uh, receiver battery pack and on off switch set up. You can take a look at it. Okay, very quickly now, I'm just showing you the battery pack and it's got the loop Velcro on the underside right here. And then here's the receiver and I've put hook on top of that and then I've put more loop on top of the switch. And the reason for that, you put that there, voila, we have the switch on top of the receiver with the loop on the bottom, we can put that onto the hook. So let's go ahead and organize this. So now I'm going to go and put the hook in there, hook down on the battery pack, and now put the receiver in there with the switch. Look at that. So what I've got to do is a little bit more organizing, get that bundle uh, made up. But you can see that Velcro can make your life almost uh, livable. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes, and uh, we'll take a look at what we've got. All right, guys, so I've finished the installation here, and I'm going to zoom in slightly. And you can see that everything is pretty well put in place. I've got a red light showing me that I do have a signal. So uh, let's take a look at this and see where we're at, okay? Let me zoom out rather than make you seasick from all the movement. And let's see how well we did on centering our rudder. Okay, now as you can see here, I've got the trim on the center line. And I've got the rudder on the center. But how close did we actually get? Well, you can see we're actually slightly off to starboard. That means the boat would want to go around in a uh, clockwise circle. So let me show you what the trim can do. And that's going to be this. Okay, I'm just moving the fine tune on the trim. And the, that is the limits of your movement. So. I'm going to get this zeroed out. I think that's pretty good. So our installation went well. We're easily within the range of the fine tune uh, on the rudder control. So uh, we've got a good rudder. Let's take a look at our sail control servo. So that's pulling it. I think I'm going to switch the servo. That should be pulling it in. Uh, that should be letting it out, but instead it's tightening it. But that's okay. So anyway, we've got an installation that looks like it'll work. Okay, well I'm getting ready to call it a night. And uh, so I'm going to do one last thing. Now I've removed all the gear. But I've got some open holes that are in my RC deck. And I want to make it a little more watertight. So just to prevent the water intrusion into the screw holes I mixed up a very small batch of epoxy and added a tiny bit of acetone to make it slightly runny. So what I'm going to do is with this sharpened stir stick I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to go and spread it around in the hole and this is going to help seal the grain so that when water gets down below I'm not ending up soaking into the RC deck and uh, causing it to get discolored. So uh, anyway, that's one last thing to do. And uh, from that point on, we're going to start getting ready to uh, think about our rigging. We're pretty close on that now. All right, so we'll see you guys in a bit. Okay, guys, uh, we're almost done with all the RC installation. So at this point, I wanted to show you one trick that was taught to me by Alan Van Ness, um, who's kind of a local legend in Seattle with the T-37s. But this is your receiver, and this is the antenna. 
if you just let this flop into the bilge of the boat, your range on your transmitter is going to be a lot less. So we want to install this antenna higher up. Now we're going to have the sail gear and uh, our sheets off to the starboard side here. So we want to keep our antenna kind of off to the port side, but we don't want it to interfere with the rudder servo. So this is what Alan taught me. You get an ordinary straw. They tend to be, uh, they tend to need to be a little bit larger. But we're going to install this soda straw under the deck and this is going to be how we're going to keep the antenna out of the bilge. Now, bonding to the thermoplastics is often a challenge. You can't just take a soda straw or any polyethylene or polypropylene or any of the other thermoplastics, slap a little epoxy on it and stick it. It tends to release. So, we need to go through a specific sequence to get it to bond. Now, this is not just for this. If you're trying to bond something else, this will work too, but as with all structural bonds, we want to start with a clean uh, surface. So I'm going to take this acetone and we're going to clean both this and we're going to clean our bonding area under the deck. All right, so this is the first step. That's now clean. I have clean gloves. We're going to clean under here. Now remember, we have, at, uh, we have varnish on the deck, and that does not like acetone, so do be careful. Okay. That's the first step. Second step, taking some Scotch-Brite. And cleaning the area there. All right, we're going to wipe it down again. Okay, so we know that this surface should be very bondable. Same thing here. I'm going to hit it with a Scotch Brite, and this is only marginally going to increase our bondability. It does give us some more surface area, but this is not truly how it's going to be bonded. Now let me get to a clean piece of the paper towel. Clean it off again. Okay. So this is now done. Let me get this out of here. So the next thing we're going to do is get a propane flame. Now, a propane flame burns clean and blue. If you took this lighter, it tends to burn yellow because it doesn't mix enough oxygen. Yellow flames have soot. We do not want soot on here. So I'm going to take a hemostat, and that's just so I can hold on to this in a flame. Make sure our uh, acetone is all gone. And what we're going to do is flame treat this. Now, if any of you uh, do snow skiing, you've had PTEX bottoms on your skis. PTEX is polyethylene. And as I said, polyethylene is very difficult to bond to. But this is how we get structural bonds. Now, this is called flame treatment. The flame is going to blast the molecules apart at the surface. We are not melting. I want to say again, we are not melting this. If you melt it, you've gone backwards. We're going to pass this very quickly. It does not have to be in the hottest part of the blue flame in the cone, but we're going to very uh, quickly pass this through the flame. The hot plasma is going to break apart the molecules on the surface and give us a bondable surface. That is plenty. In fact, it's a little too much. So we are now done with our flame treatment. We have a bondable surface. So I'm going to smear this on. 
This is a pre-mixed batch of epoxy that I've thickened. The uh, tube itself is about three inches long. It's not rocket surgery, so you don't have to be very precise. You just want it to be long enough to hold our antenna in place. All right. So I'm going to get that out of here. And we're going to glue this to the underside. And that's about all there is. You might want to turn it upside down just to make sure that your straw doesn't fall out. But uh, just clean it up, and I think we're done. That'll harden up, and we should have a very good structural bond, okay? All right, guys, we're really closing in now because we're getting ready to rig the boat. So you remember this thing? This is your mast. We're going to pull that out of here. Uh, I want to make sure that you remember to remove it before you do this. But we've got some of the uh, mast steps sticking out through the deck. We don't want that. So here I've got an abrasive cutoff wheel on my uh, Dremel, and we're going to trim this off pretty much flush. Now I put some tape down, and that's to prevent any marring should this surface hit the, uh, the deck. If this were in varnish, we could ruin our surface. Okay, so I'm going to slow this down just a wee bit. Brace your hands. You do not want to be trying to freehand this in case it cuts loose and starts uh, moving. Okay. I'm actually going to try and trim it a little closer. There, that's pretty close. So I've got maybe a sixteenth of an inch sticking up there. And that's going to be good enough. Um, I may dress it with a little bit of sandpaper, but at this point we've got that uh, mass step pretty much flush with the deck. So we'll move on and see you in just a couple. Okay guys, we're getting ready to uh, rig our main sheet leads and jib sheet leads. I um, already mixed the epoxy, so I figured I might as well get these done. To do that, you're going to need to grab the uh, brass rod. It's 1 16th inch diameter, and that's included in your kit. We're going to prep it. I've got a little bit of sandpaper here. We're going to want to make sure this is very clean. So I'm going to give it a real quick rub down. I'm going to do it again just before I put the epoxy on there because, as I've often said, the oxides that form on metals are the real bugaboo that make bonding difficult. So we want it extremely clean. All right, first thing. Now, we're going to ream out the holes with our drill bit. Very simple reason. We've got varnish in the hole. We need to get good, clean wood. So, with those cleaned in, now you can see that our brass rod just fits in there. Alright, so I'm going to sand it a little more. I'm going to give it a quick wipe with acetone. That's all pretty clean. Now, I've got needle nose pliers here. 
and we're just going to bend this into a loop. Now, let's see, is that close? I don't know how that happened, but it's pretty close. Now, this is about a quarter inch apart. These holes are a quarter inch apart, so um, very simple bend. Now, I just take my pliers with a cutter end on them. The brass cuts very easily. Give it one final quick sand. Make sure that that fits. In fact, I'm going to use this. I could use just a little bit tighter fit. Still a little tighter. There, and I think I can do that. So just so you can see, this is what that looks like. So, uh, looks like a pretty good bent piece. And I'm going to take this epoxy, and I'm going to... Actually, I think it may be just as easy to dip the ends. There we go. May have to work it a little bit, but... Okay, first one's in. Now we're just going to adjust the height. By the way, these loops are a very nice improvement over the original eyelets that the earlier kits had because I've had the sheets get caught on these uh, eyelets. And it's not much fun. And with the loops, you don't end up having that issue. Okay, so there, you can see I've got this one bonded in place. I'm going to put the other two in there. You don't need to watch that. It's all going to be the same. But uh, anyway, we will see in a little bit. Hey guys, congratulations. You're just about done with your remote control installation. At this point, I wanted to give you an option to think about. Now, previously, I had shown you how to take the uh, push rod that's included in the kit, do your bends so that you could get the rudder servo attached to the rudder itself. Uh, now, there is an option that I would like for you to consider. It's not absolutely essential because I did sail with my uh, original rudder push rod for a year before I switched. But I wanted to show you, this is called a clevis. It's available at your hobby store. And you can see that what it is, is just, in this case, it's nylon. But it is a captive way of attaching your rudder push rod to your servo and your rudder bell crank. Now, you can also get them in stainless. For example, this is a box that I got for, I don't know, three or four dollars. It's not very expensive. And these are threaded, but it does exactly the same thing. It has a captive end, and it will hold your rudder push rod positively without the ability to come loose. And these just snap together. There are lots of options. Every hobby store is going to have this plus several others. Uh, you may even go to a carbon push rod. Now, this has a couple of options, a couple of things that I like. Now, one of the things that happened on my boat uh, during one race is that I had a bundle of wires for the servos and batteries and all that uh, kind of wrapped up underneath the push rod 
it got in the water, the thing shifted, and it pushed my push rod off of the servo. So I ended up losing control of the boat. And that was the point at which I decided to switch to these clevises. So the clevis is just a way of preventing your rudder push rod from falling off. Now, there are many options. In this case, I had some nylon ones. I just showed you this, but I had these nylon uh, pieces. This is the original push rod. I just clipped the ends and then made this the identical length uh, of the original bent steel one that I had shown you before. The only downside is you can't adjust this. With these threaded toggles, you can make the length anything you want. Now, Another option is that you can go to the hardware store, and this is a 440 die. It's a number four thread with 40 threads per inch. You can also get your, you'll need this handle. And when you get your push rods, you'll take your die and you'll crank it around here. You'll cut threads into the rod, and then you can thread on your push rods. The advantage of that is that you can make the length absolutely perfect. You can fine tune it until the trim, uh, the uh, trim tab on your rudder, which is this knob here, is perfectly centered and your rudder is perfectly centered and that's kind of a nice thing. Anyway, go to your hobby store if you decide to do that. There's many options. It's not terribly expensive. And maybe someone around you has the 440 threads already. But uh, anyway, that's an option, something to think about. You do not need this absolutely to go sailing. All right, so we'll see you in a bit, and uh, we're on to rigging. Okay, all you T37 Buildicators out there, we're going to do some rigifying right now. And I thought I would start out by doing one option that I think is a pretty good idea. It's called a Barney post. Now, what is a Barney post? Now, here I've drawn a stern view of a T37, and it's pretty close to scale, <clears throat> but the green line here represents our main sheet. And when you're going into the wind, that is when you're beating, the boom wants to get pretty close to the center line. But the problem is, as you start tightening the main sheet, the main sheet is pulling mostly down. It's not pulling sideways. So the last few degrees have almost all the umph, all the torque in the servo, pulling the boom down and tightening the leech. What does a Barney post do? Well, that's a hell of a good idea. Uh, a Barney post is just some sort of rigging device, and I'm going to draw this in blue. And this is just going to be a tube that then allows the main sheet to pull sideways. We're going to put our main sheet coming up through the tube and it will pull sideways. So the angle is much, much better. Now we still bring the main sheet down through the brass tube and it will come out here. But the Barney post is just going to be something that comes up off the deck about three quarters of an inch or so. It has to be below the height of the boom, so you need to make sure it's not too high. But anyway, I'm going to take a scrap of carbon that was used for our mass partners. That's the tube that's below the deck that we slide the mast into. And I'm going to bond it on deck. Now, there is one downside to it. And that is, I'm going to put this down now. But if you look at it, I've got this covered with tape now, but this is where our main sheet comes out. And with a sliding hatch, if you have a Barney post here, it will get in the way of your sliding hatch. So that means that you're going to have to do something like a taped on hatch, which I already do, so it's no big deal for me. But just so you know, you get a better angle. Um, It'll take a little load off of your servos, but the bottom line here, and I do want to emphasize this, is it's not really going to cost you any races. It's a good idea, but it's not the end of the world if you don't install it. Remember, back to chapter one of this whole thing, T-37s are all about fun. So if you're thinking this is too much work, you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. 
it'll be just fine. So build your boat, go sailing, have fun, and if you want to have a little, another little project, do the Barney Post. If not, that's fine too. All right? In just a second, we'll get started on installing the Barney Post. See you in a few. All right, guys, we're really getting into the rigging now, so um, let's get on to installing the Barney Post. And I've got another project that I'm going to get uh, doing at the end of this. It's very small. But what I've got here is a drill gauge. It's a steel drill gauge. And this is my carbon fiber tube. And this is the scrap that was cut off of this deck here. So this happens to be 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter on the outside. I'm going to cut out my masking on the top here one size up, and that's 21 sixty-fourths of an inch. I could go a little bigger still. But anyway, the point is, is that I'm going to make a little bit extra size hole uh, in my varnish when I sand it away so that I can put a meniscus of epoxy on there. And that's going to give me a little bit of extra bonding area. All right, so this is a steel gauge. You don't absolutely have to have it. And this is my premixed epoxy. We are going to use that. So first off, I'm going to center this and then take my X-Acto knife. And this is the very narrow blade. I'm going to cut my masking away to expose the deck and the varnish on the deck. And believe me, if you were trying to do this freehand, you'd wish you had the steel gauge. But like I say, it's not absolutely essential. Alright, so here we go. Now, you should be able to see this this is our brass eyelet right here. So I've centered that, and we're going to put our Barney post right over that. Now I'm going to take my favorite little Dremel again here, and I'm, I've got an abrasive uh, tip on this, and this is, I don't know, tungsten carbide, I think. And I'm just going to cut the uh, varnish off the top. <laughs> see that I've sanded through that and I've left the eyelet uh, open there. I'm going to dab on a little bit of epoxy. I'm going to cover this. I'm going to dip the end in uh, epoxy so that I've got some wet epoxy on the end of the carbon fiber tube. But then you're going to say, but Danny, wait, what happens if we end up getting epoxy in the hole? That is a great question. You may have noticed that I've got this jar of wax here, and this is a 1 16th inch drill bit, although the one that comes in your kit would also work. And notice that I've put uh, a wrap of uh, masking tape around there. Reason for that, that will go in there, and the masking tape prevents it from dropping down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my wax, and you could use paste wax or floor wax or something like that, and I'm going to roll this around in here, and you can see I've actually got chunks of wax left on that. So I'm just going to scrape that off, and this is going to prevent the epoxy from bonding to that. Okay, so I'm going to give this a real quick wipe. All right, so nothing should stick to that right now. Do we agree? 
All right, so here is, there's our drill bit. Now you could use a piece of wire too, it really doesn't matter much. Now, I'm gonna take a Q-tip, and as always, I make sure that my epoxy is well stirred. Scrape the sides. Okay, I'm gonna put this aside, and I'm gonna to wanna to use that stir stick in just a second. But here, So I'm going around there and I'm just making sure that I've got all that newly exposed wood nice and wet with the epoxy. Okay, so that is nice and wet. Now I'm going to apply a little bit on the inside here, and like I said, this has been cleaned, it's been sanded. I wiped it down with acetone after the sanding. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my stir stick here, and I'm going to make sure that I have a good thick bead. Now when I get when I get this onto the wood, onto the deck, that epoxy is going to flow down, but you can see that that has about a sixteenth of an inch bead there. So this is all nice and wet. So there we go. All right, that looks pretty good. So I think what I'm going to do now, I'm going to wipe this down so that it doesn't become so thick that we have a problem stripping the masking tape off. We probably will anyway, but we should be able to do all right. Okay? All right. So that's going to harden there, and that should be just fine. Now, I had a second project that I wanted to do at this point, and it's just because I happen to have the epoxy already mixed up. And I took some scraps of the plywood that came in the kit, and I made this piece of wood that's about a quarter inch by a quarter inch. The exact size isn't super critical. But if you've looked in your drawings in your kit, they show the main sheet as doing a one to two purchase. And by that, I mean that if the arm moves one inch, it pulls the sheet in two inches. Now, we have to anchor that. We have to screw an eye on the underside of the deck. And the deck is so thin, I'm concerned about having the uh, eyelet screw through the deck. All this is, is a very simple little block of wood. We're going to glue it on the underside of the deck, right about there. So it's going to go on the underside here. I've already sanded the underside, and I've already cleaned it up, as with all of our structural bonds. So let me get the epoxy here. And I'm going to wet this out. And you know what? I'm going to get the whole thing wet out. I'm going to get the top saturated, and that's so that if I get water on this, it'll be protected. All right, so now it's pretty well coated. On my bond side in particular, though, I'm going to put just a little spot, a little extra spot. So here you can see I've applied a little bead there, <clears throat> and this is going to go right under there. Now again, this is not a super critical part, but it is right under here. And this is a handy little clamp. I got it at the hardware store in the dollar bin. And I'm going to stick that right there. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's going to hold that right on there. So what's going to happen is once this hardens, we're going to screw the eyelet from the underside of the deck and we're going to tie the main sheet to this eyelet. And by having this little scrap of wood here, we eliminate the possibility of screwing through the deck. Okay? Very simple thing. Um, and we'll come back in a bit. Our Barney post will be done. And um, we're going to move on to the rest of the rigging. Okay? We'll see you in a few. All right, T37 builders out there, we're moving right along. So I'm going to show you where we're at with our Barney post. Now, remember we coated this with wax. So there, our drill bit came out of the eyelet through the deck very easily. Put that out of the way. Now, we're going to have to have some sort of transition that allows for very low friction for the main sheet as it comes out of here you have a bunch of these little eyelets. And it just, just so happens that will just about be a perfect fit into this Barney post. So I'm going to mix up some epoxy and we're going to bond this into the Barney post. I have a little prep work to do. You know I always prep everything I'm going to do, which means a little sanding, a little acetone cleaning. That'll be ready to go. The brass won't bond too well but if you can kind of see that, it has uh, a low kind of center in it, so I can mechanically bond this into my carbon post. But Danny, you say, how high is the post supposed to be? That's a great question. Right now, I've got this about three quarters of an inch, maybe five eighths of an inch. I don't think I would go much higher than that. Now, depending on how you rig it, you might be able to go higher, or uh, it might be kind of pushing it if you're tying on the little uh, clips that allow for uh, unrigging very easily. So you can always start with it too high and cut it down and uh, add another little eyelet in there. That's up to you. So don't sweat it. It's a T37. Don't ever sweat it. Always have fun. All right, next thing. In your kit, you've got a bunch of these eyelets. Now, I'm going to show you a single one. This eyelet is used for a lot of applications. But do you remember the wooden uh, piece of uh, like quarter inch by quarter inch plywood we bonded under here? We need to take this eyelet and we're going to need to screw it to the underside of this. The reason for that, this is going to be where we tie our main sheet. All right? So I'm going to take just a minute. I'm going to uh, come back almost immediately. And I'm going to give you a real quick view of the back end of the cockpit so you can see what's under there, okay? And then we're going to bond in the grommet. See you in just a minute. Okay, just a real brief interlude here. So I'm going to take a Q-tip and this little bit of epoxy. I'm just going to dampen the edge. Now remember, we don't want epoxy running down here into our eyelet. So I'm just going to dampen the edge at the top very lightly. Okay, that's all we needed for that. Now, this is the more critical part. I need to put a bead of epoxy right into here. So what I'm going to use for that is, the, <clears throat> is this sliver that I have shaved off of a popsicle stick. I'm going to very carefully run that right in the groove. So you see I'm putting that in the groove of the eyelet, filling up that groove. So that I will have a mechanical bond. I know that there's an oxide on this brass that will prevent really good bonding, but we should have plenty of bonding just mechanically holding this in this way. Okay. Also notice I put this paper towel here for the very simple reason 
that my reasoning was it's such a small part it would be very easy for this part to fall onto the deck and clearly that's something I do not want to see happen. So there we go. Pressed in place. I think I'm going to need to push it a little bit harder with just a stick or something. But basically you get the idea. It's a pretty nice fit. Uh, should hold in there just fine. So I'm going to get this pressed in and I'm going to show you the underside of the deck in just a second. We'll see in a bit. Alright guys, I wanted to give you a real quick view of to what's going on under the deck. Here I've got the brass screw eye that I've screwed into that one quarter inch by one quarter inch plywood block we glued to the underside. By the way, I realize if you pre-drill the hole before you glue it under the deck, that'll make screwing in the eye a lot easier. Here we've got that orange soda straw that's going to be where we stick the antenna from the receiver. Here we've got the Barney post and we've got the brass round guide through there. And then, of course, we've got the rudder post. Anyway, that's the underside of the deck. Wanted you to take a look and see what's going on there. Just make sure that you understand everything that's going there, okay? We'll talk to you in a bit, and we're going to continue rigging. See you in a bit.